Good evening. Welcome to uh, the fourth installment of our program, Searles After Dark. I am your host for this week, Searles. Uh, my first name is Justin. It's a pleasure to meet you. If you're just tuning in now, you've missed less than you might think based on the fact that it's almost three hours of content, but still a significant amount of context. What we're doing is we're building an application uh, using OpenAI's, uh, well, right now, OpenAI's API to do something that's kind of like ChatGPT, but this time talking in Japanese to practice Japanese language, yada, yada. I recommend starting at episode one, uh, where we kick off building a new Ruby on Rails application. We are taking it slow. We are chewing our food. We are enjoying and uh, luxuriating in every single step along the way of making the software sausage here. And, uh, you know, in the process, talking about our feelings, how we think through things. Uh, and of course, because you can't speak, I, I can't hear you. If you email us at, and by us, I mean me, at let's at playstupid.games, then I can hear about your feelings. But right now I cannot hear about your feelings. Uh, however, so when I say we, I mean in the royal we, I mean I'm, like, I'm trying to establish a sense of intimacy. Let's just roll with it. Uh, what we are trying to do is establish a cadence of work that is more like real everyday work where you're on a team and you're working on a project and the ideal project isn't rushing at breakneck speed. You have time to think and, and uh, t try multiple approaches before you just, you know, shotgun the first thing that possibly works uh, and compiles and seems to, to run okay and maybe passes your tests and then merge as fast as possible so you can move on to the next thing. Working at breakneck speed is one way to score story points or make a manager happy in the short term, uh, but it's not an effective way to sustainably build software. And uh, you're probably here because you know that already. Uh, so I won't lecture you. Uh, again, when you send me your emails, you don't have to complain about that when I got it. Uh, okay, so this evening, uh, we're gonna do something special. Uh, I am probably best known for software testing and we have made just enough of a mess at getting this thing to kind of sort of work uh, through a web interface uh, that I would like to take a, take a pause, stop trying to get more shit to work and instead focus on let's uh, refactor what we've got. Let's break stuff down into kind of more sensible units, see if any patterns emerge that we might reuse later or, or, or apply in other ways. If nothing else, we get better names out of it. And then backfill, uh, uh, well, maybe backfill, maybe just start with test-driven development, but backfill in isolated unit tests to show off how I do that, how I write unit tests that fake out all of their dependencies of this thing being tested to test the interaction between the, the subject under test and its dependencies, as opposed to just like you normally would, you know, you, you, you instantiate an object, you call it its functions, you pass it realistic parameters, you, 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 know, you call through to the database or whatever, uh, and then you make sure it's working when it's all plugged together. This is much more of a, a delicate approach to kind of listening to whether that API is usable, uh, whether or not those interactions are all operating at the same level of abstraction. Uh, so you're going to hear us talk a little bit about mixed levels of abstraction as we break this down. All right, and I'm thirsty. So tonight's uh, uh, sponsored beverage is a gin and tonic made with uh, three ingredients uh, in addition to the ice. Uh, first of all, the Fever Tree Mediterranean tonic water, which is quite popular. You may have seen it around. The gin is, uh, in, in the Searles household, currently our favorite gin. This is Roku Gin from Suntory. Uh, and what we've learned from Roku, it's a Japanese gin full of like Japanese botanicals and, and herbals, is it's actually, uh, I always thought I just like, I liked real straight dry gins. It didn't have a whole lot of extra flavors put in them. Um, but it turns out I just don't like juniper and I don't like a lot of European ones. Uh, this one, real good. Real, you know... So bitter. I love it. Well, and because it's not bitter enough, <laughs> this is uh, Sudachi vinegar extract. So Sudachi is, I don't know if you can see it right there, it's a little tiny itty bitty lime that's been crossbred with other Japanese citrus. And it is so sour, it is pungent. And so I just squeeze a little bit of there in there. <sighs> yep, fits my mood. All right, so uh, uh, first some housekeeping notes. Uh, today, because every week now, every episode, OpenAI, they're watching the show, they're excited about what we're doing. They announce a brand new <laughs> revolutionary update to their products and, and, and core technologies. Uh, GPT-4 has been announced. This is 
the upgrade of the uh, uh, GPT-3 model that had been driving chat GPT. In fact, they kind of said it was like a 3.5 and that 4 was coming. So this was telegraphed. Uh, judging by, I have not read, I'm not a news reporter, uh, <laughs> but judging by the fact it says chat GPT plus here, I, I take that to mean that the GPT-4 algorithm and model, it, because it's probably more expensive, is only currently being um, used if you are a plus subscriber. I think it's like $20 a month to use chat GPT. Uh, you know, if you're a hustle bro, you're already there. Uh, if you're not a hustle bro, I don't know. <laughs> There's probably better ways to spend 20 bucks a month, um, but I don't know. In fact, if you found a better way, one that is worth $20 a month to you, I have the blog post for you because also today uh, I released a, a blog post called How to Tell If AI Threatens Your Job. If you go find it on LinkedIn, I made a silly little video to promote it. Uh, what this post is, is reflections on the three months of me using a lot of, more months now, I guess six months of using GitHub Copilot, uh, of using a lot of AI tools and then getting down to uh, basically a three-step framework for thinking through whether or not your job is at risk from AI and which jobs are sort of generative AI resilient. And so if your job produces novel stuff, uh, it is solved via unpredictable forms, processes, and, and, and features, like you know, uh, uh, each thing I build with software, I arrive at it in a completely different way. And if there was a really consistent process to building software, this job would be a lot easier. Uh, and uh, if your work, work product is fragile, if it breaks easily, then uh, you might have what it takes to have a job that's going to be pretty difficult for, for AI to, to, to uh, su supplant. Supplant? I think that's a word. Yeah, supplant, of course. What's up, plant? Um, and then, of course, if you're finding that your job maybe doesn't meet all these criteria, here's some things you can do to add value at your current role and maybe delegate the delegatable stuff by, for example, paying $20 a month for ChatGPT and just adopt the tool early so that you're at the leading edge of the thing that might end up disrupting your role. Uh, so you can find that over at blog.testdouble.com. You can also follow me on Mastodon. Look at me. I'm, 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 I'm tooting my socials. That's not me. This is me. I'm Mastodon at social at at Searles. Uh, if you're ever looking for who I am, you can always find me at my website. That's us, two episodes ago. Haven't updated this with the third one yet. I just really wanted to come up with a way to do YouTube embeds. All right, so that is more than enough preamble. I've gotten you super excited for code. I'm now looking at my watch, and I am setting a stopwatch so I can know how much time I've burned starting now. So if that was eight minutes, if that was five minutes, I've got a terrible, terrible judge of time. The ice is melting. That is concerning. Let's dive in. So I had already started the server, but just to, to recap, if you're playing the home edition of this game, this code base is not open source. In fact, I haven't even pushed it to GitHub yet because I'm very lazy. Uh, good thing this computer is backed up. All right, I'm running the server. Now let's recap. Where, uh, what does it do? Currently, it looks like this. I realize, like, unless you're viewing this at 4K, we should probably just improve. We're going to play with this a little bit just to make sure that it works. But we should probably improve the UI just enough to be legible. We're not going to learn Tailwind today. That's not the goal. But we're going to do a couple things. We're going to look at the application layout. Nice big font here. Uh, we are going to make a wrapper div around all these other divs. Uh, five down. Close that div. I don't have any, um, I had an auto formatter for ERB. I must've turned it off when I was trying to diagnose what was so slow um, about my setup. All right, so we're gonna create some classes here uh, to at this moment just set max width. So max width, uh, let's call it 2XL uh, is, is the max width of the, 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 the main container that we want. And if I look at that, if I hover over that, yeah, that'll tell me that's 42 around calculated out to 672 pixels. That's reasonable. 3, 3XL for this kind of app might, might also be fine, especially with a sidebar or something like that in the UI Chrome. Uh, or, I, you know, go full screen, be appy, I don't know. Uh, additionally, we want to make that text real big. So we're going to make it big. Uh, uh, again, if you've never seen Tailwind before, it's a utility class tool. So these are utility classes and I am uh, typing them in. Because I've zoomed in my text a lot, the autocomplete is also very zoomed in. And so it's like significantly less helpful. Although, hmm. Yeah. Okay, 2XL. Yeah, all right, well, I don't know. 
It's autocomplete is more helpful when you can read the things in autocomplete. Uh, pro tip. All right, so we're going to make that bigger. Uh, and then we're also going to set MX auto. This is going to set on the uh, X, X axis margin set to auto, which will center anything underneath it in the div uh, in theory. So I refresh the page and now here we go. I've got everything here. And uh, because the message uh, dingus goes to the bottom, we'll just have to scroll. I'm not going to figure out uh, overflow right now with uh, this non-design. And maybe between messages, we'll just do a little tiny bit of work in the show thing to say between each message, maybe we'll write. Again, we're just keeping it real simple. Just a horizontal rule so we can keep them straight. All right, plain old, plain old HTML. I'm not gonna solve the problem. Uh, the, one of the hardest problems in computer science is how to style input boxes, uh, this form that is otherwise invisible until you click on it. Uh, I realize that uh, screencasts are a visual medium. Just putting that on the table that I realize that. Okay, <laughs> we have fun here. So going back to codes, this is the thingy that we started working on last week. I'm gonna hide all my UI Chrome now. Asks for a reply under namespace under a chats module. Lives in app lib because it's not a model, it's not a Rails defined thing. Uses data.define, which is the new Ruby 3.2 API for creating struct like objects of um, what I call values or value objects, objects who are there to hold on to data and to represent complex types of data, uh, but who should not have application, excuse, uh, by the way, I tend to anthropomorphize code whenever I'm talking about its organization. So if that bothers you, it's uh, uh, let's at playstupid.games uh, and you can complain and I will hear you and I'll lose sleep over it because of you. So keep that in mind. Uh, so we found one thing about data.define that I didn't love, and I've kind of found a couple others as well uh, offline. I was just like, I don't know if this really adds a whole lot for the way that I use uh, uh, struct typically is my tool of choice. In particular, the requirement that I set every single thing kind of makes it an, a bad choice for any, any struct-like object that's going to have like a lot of nil values. Um, there's got to be a way to set a default though, right? I'm going to get down into this Googling rabbit hole that I did last time, aren't I? Def um, default value. Hey, look, my blog is now third on Google. There's only thing that bugs me is there's no way to set default better. You can override initialize. Sarah sort of seems like if the goal of this like convenience class is to once and for all finally solve, crack the case of how to make a struct in Ruby, that overriding the constructor should not be the way to do it. Um, but maybe I am crotchety. Uh, it feels like to me setting them as keyword args would be more natural. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to stick with this or not. I'm going to defer that decision to the last responsible moment. Last responsible moment is a concept from Agile Software uh, land. Uh, in the mid-2000s was when I first heard it, maybe late 2000s, I guess. Uh, uh, that is to say, if you've got an arbitrary decision that needs to be made, but there's higher priority, higher risk, more important stuff to do right now, fixing that decision, making that decision early, uh, ties your hands for later. And later is always a moment where we're going to know more. So I've talked about how later equals never, and you should always, you know, uh, uh, fix stuff up front when, it, when, you know, instead of just letting bugs fester. This is a little bit different. This is super nuanced. And this is why we take our time. When we say wait for the last responsible moment to make that kind of decision, it's so that we have the maximum possibility space. M maximum possibility space the most freedom of movement to make the right decision later where we will know more. So for example, I could change this to struct and then run into something an hour from now when I really care more about like the, the, the behavior of my value objects, maybe something about mutability, for example, and realize, ah, oh, I should have gone to data.define. And then I got to go and re unwind all of this across a whole bunch of different places. 
if there's a way to punt on a decision uh, or punt on a sort of cyclic kind of like six of one, half a dozen of the other, third episode in a row, I can remember saying that phrase, uh, just punt on it. And then at a moment where like you really do have to make the decision, make it then because future you is going to have a lot more context. If you fix it now, you might have to undo it later or you might just find your uh, hands tied by it. So we're going to punt on it. So what I don't like about this, let's talk about refactoring this unit. So what it does now is I mentioned last week that this, it says asks for a reply, but it does like three things at least. One is it creates a new message. So in order to ask for the reply, it's, it's building the message to be replied to. That's a thing. It sends a network request, which is a, a not just a, hey, send network request of this message. So like the argument here is not message. It's, it's like, yo, post to this specific route and like also prompt the computer to do all this and also use this specific model and also limit the tokens with this magic number. It's a lot. That's pretty uh, um, informationally dense. So it's a, a very fraught uh, fragile responsibility for this uh, unit called asks for a reply to have. You could look at that and say, well, you're asking for the reply. That's literally what you're doing. But what you're really doing here is you're just making a network request to like complete the sentence. And then finally, what it does is it will, if that much was successful and it got a response back, it will build yet another message to represent the reply, save that reply, and then what it ends up being is sort of this, you know, uh, four-pronged uh, decision tree that collapses all of the different known uh, uh, and handled end states with, in, into that standard value object so that whatever this method returns will behave the same way and answer the same questions by, you know, providing these four values to our controller, which is over here. Nope, not over there. You were supposed to be my pair on that one. Uh, over here in messages controller where it creates a message. That way we can do something like just say, hey, result.success, result.error message, the stuff that we really care about. I'm sure we're using, um, what else do we, do we call the reply? We don't use the reply. Why am I setting it? I guess if we redirect to the chat, yeah, do we not use it? Maybe I was thinking we would need it. That one quick way to test this. One thing I like to do when I'm like about to undertake a refactor, other than to like recap, like what the hell is this thing? These are the three that we see referenced. Uh, you know, reply is not even part of the story for three of these cases because they're all handling errors. If I refresh this page and I'm creating a new message called, um, what time is it? Imo nanji desu ka? That's not really answering my question. It's just translating it. Uh, that still seemed to work. So that reply uh, on the result seems to not even have been necessary. And that was the thing that I was stressed about with having optionals or having a, a default value. So uh, oddly enough, the thing that I was worried about that would have led me to change this to a struct uh, was unnecessary if I just applied 30 seconds of sitting around thinking about it because it turned out that the, the, the reason the value was nil most of the time was it was not necessary. It's funny how that sort of thing works. Incredibly herbal. So if you don't like the juniper, but you do like the idea, if you liked the idea of juniper and gin until you actually tried normal gin, try out Roku gin by Centauri. All right. So one responsibility, check. Uh, responsibility two, make a message. Save the message, check. Responsibility three, save another message. So it saves two different messages based on probably differently shaped data, but maybe not. It, both are just params being sent to chat.messages build. So maybe, maybe something could do both of those things. 
what I'm doing is I'm like looking for, uh, this is a theater production. Every time I have a, 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 a unit of code that performs application behavior, what I see happening here as I start to enumerate its responsibilities is I see, okay, well, this is a job to be done. This is the same job to be done just a second time. This is another job to be done just done this one time, but importantly, in this order. And then this is just a mess of ifs and else's, which is, it, which is work. And if you think of, here's this phrase I promised, if you think of a Boolean state that is used as a branching condition in an if-else expression, that Boolean state is a primitive, which is the lowest form of data, <laughs> just like a pun is the lowest form of comedy. Uh, <laughs> it's a good thing my friend Aaron, who's a uh, relentless punter, doesn't watch this program. Please don't tell him, because uh, puns are everything to him. All right. Because that's primitive, lots of like if else kind of logic, too much of it, more than just like one or two branches, smells to me like I am mixing levels of abstraction by having a lot of primitive stuff and then like higher order stuff around it, like saving to a database and uh, uh, you know posting over the network. And you'll see what it looks like when we extract it because I'm very confident. I'm mildly confident that we'll be able to figure this out in our uh, self-imposed time limit of some amount of time until I give up. All right. <laughs> we are uh, going to... We have two options in front of us. We could just kind of like save all this to a scratch file and nix it. Pretend, know that this spike works. Test drive it as if it didn't already exist and then just slot in the little pieces into the new bits that shake out. That would do a better job of showing how I typically write code, especially for clients or for real serious production work. Uh, alternatively, we could extract into the shape of like naming those responsibilities and creating objects, but it would do a, sh it would do a, um, a, a subpar job of demonstrating like the point of mock uh, mocking objects. And that's something that I don't get to show off enough. So let's not do that. You've all refactored and extracted code, extract method, extract class or, or type. That's not, not exactly newsworthy. Um, so what we're going to do instead is we're going to just go see I think I can select a, a language. Going down here, it says plain text. If you say like Ruby, this is still going to be a nothing file, but at least it'll be formatted. How I like. All right, so we're gonna grab all, all the marbles. And by all the marbles, I mean all the marbles except for that last end. Nope, all the marbles and then also, that much nesting is also, it's a smell. By smell, it doesn't mean, it's not judgment. It is literally judgment, I'm judging this. But it's not like a sure fire, you know, smoking gun evidence of badness. It's just, a, you know, keep an eye on it. I feel, I feel like my doctor now, where every time I go into the doctor, he's like, well, this, this result is really bad. I'm like, oh, really? Like, is there anything we can do? He's like, oh, you know, keep an eye on it. Uh, and then I, you know, I keep an eye on it. And then I go back and then I got a new doctor. Yeah, I got to make some calls. All right. So, <laughs> shit, now I'm distracted. Justin shares his medical history on YouTube, and it's going to go great. There are a couple tools I like for um, quickly moving between uh, test classes and real classes. And one is called um, Alternate File, and I may or may not have it set up right now. Uh, and and the way that I set it up was is with a projection.json file which it seems to be lacking. So I think the answer is I don't have it set up right now. Yeah, I couldn't create an alternate file. All right. I'm going to zippity doodah into a terminal that's going to go and look at 
um, a code base I unfortunately I just I'm not at liberty to share this code base with you. I wish I was. Uh, that also appears to not have. Oh boy, I'm gonna find this. You're gonna yeah I it I'll give you a hint. My issue is not eye health related. So so if you're seeing redness in my in, in my eyes, that's just the. This is that G and T working its magic. And the stress of being on social media too much today. All right. Why is it not there? Interesting. So it's, um, I'm looking at a couple other projects that I know have alternate files set up. And, and it's not showing up. Uh, I'm looking for that projections file, uh, which is a standard quote unquote from Vim projectionist from a friend of the show, Tim Pope and Vim extraordinaire that lets you specify uh, types of files like here, here's all my Java files and here's their alternates in this path kind of structure. Uh, what I'm looking for is prior art of another app. Huh. Okay. I think I got it. I've got a very, very silly uh, way of setting up my, my project dot files. And I've spent enough time on this already that it's probably not a good use of our time. I'll show off my pro tips of my mediocre at best Unix skills some other time. <laughs> okay, that was a very uh, underwhelming copy and paste. I, I just did PB copy and I hit paste and I expected like more than this. Uh, but that's what we get. Still didn't work. Can I convert undefined to nil object? It's not a great... Not a great move. Is it because test doesn't exist? Did I like generate this without test? No, test is there. Okay, what if I make lib? Can I convert undefined to nil object? Do I have the extension installed? I do have alternate file installed. There's a thing I could have said initialize projections file. It sort of seems like I have more fundamental problems with this tool right now. If I uninstall, reload require. This is part of pairing, right? We're not getting to write the code right now because we have to futz. And futzing is like too much of the battle most of the time. All right. What are we, what are we doing? All right, I'm going to, I'm going to finish the tree because it's got to get created anyway. Test lib chats. Is that really my problem? Do you think? All right. Alternate file. Nope. Same thing. I had a map to a key binder, so it's not a key binder. All right. Well, we're just going to do this the old fashioned way of me being far less fancy. I was so excited to show off my workflow to you. And now I just feel like a big old idiot. As for reply test dot com. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, when I write unit tests, I use a uh, mini test as opposed to R spec. Uh, I can talk about that later. Uh, I also usually will create. Oh, that's cute. I will usually create a special subclass of uh, either active support test case or usually even better a mini test test for tests that are going to be isolation tests no rails needed not that rails is slow but just that it limits the surface area of what's accessible test helper uh, there is probably already a test helper there we go so we've included a couple things like my little non-committal toy uh, which which prevents committing to um, 
like things like fixtures through to the database uh, by using some fancy trigger nonsense, I think. We don't, doesn't look like we've added mocktail yet. So we're going to add a new test dependency to our test group in the gem file called mocktail. Mocktail is a test double library for mocking, which are all terms that you may or may not be super familiar with. Uh, I realize now as I even talk through this that I don't have a good way to run these tests. Um, I'm also kind of between tools that I like for running tests. Um, it's it's a sore su subject. I had a really good thing going and then it just stopped working, similar to my alternate file thing. <sighs> but you know what always keeps working is like just the shell. So if we have to run all of our tests through the shell, that's what we'll do. Now over the test helper, I'm going to create uh, unit test and extend uh, mini test test. We'll start there. And we're going to include the mocktail DSL since most of the time when we're writing a unit test, about half the time, we're going to be, we're going to be writing isolation tests of interactions between objects. And the other half of the time, we're going to be writing tests of pure functions where we don't need mocktail. But we're going to include it anyway and make it simple. All right. So here, uh, let's start uh, by, uh, I, you now you, you might have noticed that there, it was using this uh, blocky syntax. I actually like, you know, mini test doesn't support this. This is a, this is a rails ism. And I prefer just saying, yo, it's just a method. Let it have its ears. So, uh, there are four edge cases or there's four outcomes. So let's think of the first outcome, successful reply. Okay. Cause I think there's only one case of a successful reply and we can go check it out in a file that I've jammed over in the corner of a basement somewhere. Here we go. No, I don't care about saving this. I'm just going to read it. All right. False, false, false. Yeah, there's only one successful outcome. There's three failure cases. So let's focus on the successful outcome and just do that first. Confident code. All right. Now, if I'm looking at this code here, I've got the value object because I know what that is. And it, it's kind of immaterial. For me, values, whatever you're passing into functions, out of functions, that's just sludge that moves through the pipe. The values might have methods on them, but those methods really should just elucidate the data. They shouldn't actually have application behavior. This is a, a, a unit of code that has application feature behavior, and therefore, uh, that's why I'm writing this kind of test. I would not mock data objects. I would just mock out the things that have the application behavior. Uh, and so in that way, there's a bifurcated sense of what's a dependency of asks for reply. So let's do some setup. Uh, we can either do setup do, uh, but again, liking methods, I, I tend to default to the methods. That said, I've been burned enough because you can say setup do many times and each test can have its own setup and teardown block uh, passed to the class method. Uh, but if you do def setup and you forget to run super, the earlier ones or the ones in the parent classes don't run. So we're going to go ahead and just call setup do. It's not like I need C tags or something for that. All right. It successfully identified the name of this thing. Now, what's interesting, and this is sort of where uh, you and I might deviate in our experience, is I will want to identify the 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 code I wish I had to borrow a phrase from uh I think it was Richie from like the CNR old school C uh SICP class that was what it was not C but like Lisp so what's the code I wish I had I wish I had something that could save a message I wish I had something that could uh call to the API and I wish I had something that could formulate a response. And I'm not sure if the thing that saves will return its own response or whether I need to branch in here. So like, you know, if there's ultimately a cyclomatic complexity of four branches, maybe 
the correct answer is instead of having all four branches in this class, having two uh, in, in, in two subclasses. So let's just focus on the two things that are real work first. So those things need names. Uh, uh, let us name them. So one of them we will call uh, saves message, persists message. Let's call it saves message for now. Instead of in, uh, instantiating it, which is what Copilot wanted to do, we're going to do something very silly. We're going to do mocktail of next. What this tells you, uh, mocktail, is the next time anybody else instantiates save message, return them a phony one and return that same phony one right here. What that'll do is it'll allow me to um, access the same instance of the mock from both the test and from the subject under test. And then I can do things like configure stubbings and verify invocations. If all that sounds like, psh, let's just keep going. It'll make sense eventually. All right, next up, uh, that is the wrong API. Uh, we want to have something for um, completing the prompt or using our own language instead of OpenAI's language. Um, submits message. Submit sounds, it's too form heavy, right? You want a name that stands alone, like save, we know what save does. Uh, hmm. Transmit, we'll do transmits message. Mocktail of next. And we're gonna just write the whole test. Let's just write the code we wish we had. So if we had something called saves message and something called transmits message, you know, we know that we would get a result object out of this. Uh, so we'd say subject. Dot, yep, ask for a reply. Uh, we know what the parameters are. They are a chat and they are attributes. Is message? I think text is actually the name. And oddly enough, text is the the the, the name of the attribute because Co GitHub Copilot previously in a previous life recommended us to call it text, not message. That's funny. All right, so that's what that looks like. So that's what the invocation is going to look like. And then we want to assert things about the result, like that it is successful. We want to assert equal that the, yep, that the, the message text is what we think. And that error message is nil, which we can do with assert nil. There we go. All right, so those are the three things we want. Now, now we got to configure or like like turn clockwise like a little dummy version of saves message and transmits message to coordinate the interaction of those things such that we arrive at that outcome so let's say we have uh we're going to use a special api here where we can perform an invocation uh, perform a demonstration rather of like what how i expect the save message thing to be called this is me discovering is why I sometimes call this discovery testing. This is me discovering like the API that I wish I had here. So I liked verb first naming for the classes. I like the verb to be the name of the only public method on the class, at least for starters. I know that I need to provide the chat and the attributes. Yep, just like that. Uh, I could be drier by saying just like, like like a reference to a, a variable here this text hello i don't know if it matters in fact it matters so little all of this is like all these like arguments are is just batons to make sure that they are exactly whatever gets passed in so they could be symbols they don't have to be real objects i don't have to instantiate a real chat because it doesn't matter all that matters is that this thing gets past a chat or a chat is just anything so, uh, because it's going to be passed in from us. So pass in this thing, dummy, to save message. When you do that, <clears throat> stub with, what does save message return? True. Right? Do we need anything else? Do we need the message? I think we might need the message, right? 
Because when we when we say when we save here, we've assigned this a variable. So clearly we're going to be referencing the message because right here we're using the message text. So that means we want to return the message. We'll call it the message and also just leave it as a symbol. But that's not enough. We also need to know if it was successful or a failure. So look at that. So we just answered a couple questions. What we probably need is a result object because if it fails, we need that success to say false. And if it succeeds, we need the message to be populated. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a ask for reply result, uh, a new it up, as I like to say. And uh, we're going to, speaking of newing it up, I'm going to new line this line. And I'm going to say, all right, so message, now it's the message. And here is where I'm going to get really angry at this define thing yelling at me about uh, unspecified args. So error message is nil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what was the third one? Thank you. See, spicy autocomplete. Success is true. Okay. So if saves message gets called in exactly this way, if you say like, hello, McFly, that's going to not, we don't want that to work. So what we're saying is if it's called exactly like this, then return this message. Otherwise return nothing because like you have not satisfied the stubbing. That might feel weird, but it works. Because what we're doing is we're not verifying correctness, we're verifying that the interactions are sound. It's a different threshold, it's a different goal. Transmits message dot transmit. Now you can see that originally GitHub Copilot said saves message dot call. And then it picked up on like the hunch of like, ah, oh, he wants to call these by the verb of the thing. All right. Yeah. So like GitHub Copilot's not all bad. It's, it's pretty clever, actually. All right. This is going to return yet another result. Of course, it's like much less good at indenting. Uh, and this result, we also want to be true. Okay. So this is um, a different message. This is a reply message, I suppose, right? We know it's got to be different. And if it were the exact same, that would be. Um, an incomplete test as well, because we could just return the first one and pass, if that makes any sense. No error message, success true, ask for the result. Uh, instead of getting hello back, we're just gonna say assert equal and that the result message is this magical symbol because the actual, whether or not it's a real message object is immaterial because our subject under test won't even be aware of that. All right, so let's take, um, this shortcut to get the uh, path. Oops. Is there a way to make this bigger without uh, toggle size to content with? Okay. Increase the zoom. I feel like that increased the other one. Hmm. I want to make this bigger and it doesn't seem to typically work. All right, we're just gonna run it. Excuse me if you, if you, if this is hard to read. Okay. Setup do failed. Ah, because I extended from a uh, mini test test and setup do is a convenience afforded us only by uh, active support. So we're gonna say def setup. Run it again. Uninitialized context, constant, saves message. This stuff turns out doesn't exist. Also, it, I duplicated that line. All right, so remember what I said about Jay Fields and how he had advised us that the goal of TDD is either to make the test pass or change the message. When you're doing mockist or isolation or goose, growing object oriented software, or discovery testing, whatever you call a methodology like this, you are just spending a lot of time changing the message. It really starts to feel, after a little while, like paint by numbers. All right, so we're going to say saves message dot rb module chats class. Again, I had some pretty cool plugins that were automating a lot of this for me, and they they violated my trust. What can I say? They were slow, and I'd rather have I'd rather not have them than have them be slow. So I'm happy to type. Cool. Did I change the message? Yes, I did. Now it's complaining about transmits. 36 minutes plus eight 
Okay, so this is going to be a longer episode because I was like, I want to get through a little bit of this. Transmits message. Okay. Module chats. Class transmits message. Go back. Run again. No method save exists for uh, such, and, such and such. Oh, yeah, the definition uh, uh, dinguses are also, dingus extensions are also not set. So here's a cool feature of Mocktail. You can see it's like, hey, I don't have a save method on the saves message thingy-majigger. Uh, this is what I was expecting. Maybe you want to define this method. Why don't you just grab this? <laughs> and it'll be like, boom, okay, cool, you got that now. Instead of some chat, of course, I could have just used a simple chat. It would have been fewer characters, and it would have also given me the correct prompt for the argument. Uh, and here we go. Now I'm going to see if I can change the message again. Boom, shakalaka. What do you say? Now we're back at the transmits message. And again, instead of the message, we can just say, it's like the weekend. Change it again, run it again, undefined method success for nil. Now we're in business because it's not getting anything back. So now we can go back up and start saying, how do we get these things that we just fancifully created? I'm gonna, uh, not going to be creating any more files, so I'm going to make this smaller or, or expand our, our view a little bit. All right. So here, okay, this is funny. This is the first time I've done this uh, in earnest with Copilot helping out. Uh, that's not true. In, a, in an empty code base, though, it might be. It thinks I want to use traditional dependency injection because usually when you see somebody doing TDD like this, you're doing traditional dependency injection. But you'll note that Mocktail uh, is one of only a couple gems, and I think I wrote both of them, that will subtly inject through magic uh, by, by hijacking the new method exactly one time for the next time dot new is called on the class or on the type. So we're going to say def initialize, take no args. We don't need them. Where we're going, I, I could have saved myself like a whole, uh, yeah, see, three seconds. Okay, so we're going to instantiate them that way. Run the test again, it'll, we'll get the same message. Yep. This time, though, we're going to say if, uh, uh, nope, not chat nil. If, yeah, all right. That's actually exactly what I probably would write. Uh, so wrapping in parens, that is the standard Ruby compliant way to indicate to the linter that like your intention is both to pass a truthiness test and also to assign a variable. Without the parentheses, you, you're, you haven't given a signal to the reader whether or not you might have just accidentally left it off, left off a double equals when you, when you meant to. And, and therefore have a too permissive of a true side of the branch. But this works great. Saves message, chat, and adders. It just forwards those along. If that's successful, then do this. And then I'll say, hey, okay, so uh, if double result, if reply, um, and in fact, this returns the message, right? So we'll say if reply transmits message, dot transmit message, dot success. Then, then what do we do? What do we do? Do we need it? We don't. So this is the case of not needing multiple ifs. See how we're sort of just discovering it through usage? We're like, well, if we call everything right, we do the right thing, we should just get the right, right result. This is a very brave statement for somebody to make who hasn't run this test. Okay. Uh, in line 11, one thing I do like is this start starts up. Given to expand. Do I need to put... Is that what it's saying? I know in recent versions of Ruby 3... It's a little unclear when you're going to get your stuff coerced into a hash versus not. But now line 11 is saying this. So save message, did I forget something? Oh, yep. I, I, this is a keyword arg. This is not a, taking a hash. 
This is like this is a case of Ruby 3.0 being successfully more strict, I, I believe. And there and perfect, it caught that bug. All right. Still came back nil. No. All right, all right. Let's see. We can do raise hurrah if we got that far. Do we get that far? Okay, we got that far. Good. Uh, now we can use my old friend Tap. Tap just, uh, if you've never used Tap, Tap's a really handy way to have a side effect without changing the return value of an expression. So this uh, expression is still going to return whatever the hell this is returning, but by calling Tap, it's like you're tapping a pipe in a chain, and this block arg is the thing, whatever this thing is, is going to be what result is, and I can say puts.result, dot inspect, for example, run my little command, see what I get. I get nil, that's a sign that I did something wrong. Maybe I'm passing it the whole result object. You know, maybe that's what I did. Let's take a look. Transmit the message. Oh, shit. Ah, this is not a message, this is a message result. The message sits on that, right? Okay, so message result dot message, I guess. It's really a save result. So we'll call it that. Save result. See? So even this simple of a, a value object, look at how a practiced hand like mine can still be a big old dummy. Okay, so uh, one nice thing about tap is because it doesn't change the return value, that test passed in spite of me not having removed my stupid debugger. Okay, so that, that test passes. We are now at 43 minutes, so we're about, we're about 50 minutes. I, I don't want to go over an hour. I don't know why. Oh, for three hours. I've got a lot of stamina. Um, also, I don't know. Tonic water gets me energized. Maybe it's all those anti-malarial quinines. <laughs> ah, hello. Good evening. All right. We're going to say... We're going to do some copy-paste. Dry is not everything. Do not repeat yourself. It's not message, but failed uh, reply. All right, so the first thing is going to succeed, and then the second thing here, can't see it. Success true is what that says. I suppose what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to say, whoa, uh, I hit some keystroke combo that just nulled out everything. Okay. So... We're going to say success, oh yes, not success true, success false. That's how you know it's a failure. Uh, and I'll, I'll throw an error message on just to be sort of like, you know, at the end of the day, this test isn't making sure everything works. It's making sure that the interactions are happening as I specify. And as a result, it lives as documentation more than anything. In fact, if you were to like go through and delete all of these isolation tests later, it wouldn't be the end of the world. But they're also like the tests that are like least likely to fail if nothing's changing about those interactions, but most likely to fail if you do refactor how those interactions happen. And that's where I think mocking gets a bad name is like if you're using it at multiple levels of abstraction, again, we'll have to come up with um, um, additional ways to, to talk about that as a concept. Uh, they're going to change all the time because every like like if I it, imagine we were trying to cram in a bunch of business logic in here while some of the stuff was just arbitrarily fake, like yeah, the fake stuff would be in a hostile environment where stuff's breaking all around it. But if everything is fake, it's actually like a clean room, neat, tidy thing, and actually makes sense. Like the moment when you change one of those clean room, tidy dependencies is when you would also change the test. It's not just like a bunch of tests are breaking. Uh, you, what this allows you to do is successfully segregate your delegation behaviors and your logic having behavior. And it gets you in a prompt of thinking there are two types of, of workers. Just, <laughs> there's man pointy haired boss managers, and then there's the real workers that do the pure functions that make you think real hard. And this is just shoveling shit back and forth with, with clever names. Uh, this is manager work. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right. So if this happens and I ask hello or whatever, and now I'm going to refute success, and I'm going to say that uh, kind of the exact opposite, a certain uh, equal or a certain nil rather result dot message. Thank you, spicy autocomplete. 
and result uh, uh, sorry, equal lol with this. See if command R works. Nope, I don't have the, uh, the, the runner set up at all. Get around to that. So that just passed. Now, never trust a test that you haven't seen fail. The fact that that just test, uh, that, that test passed tells me I probably fucked up and it probably isn't working. Oh, nope, it worked. All right, so LL versus LOL. So we're just gonna return that. Basically, all, what that's saying is like, you know, I'm planning for four branches. I have four branches in my head, but I didn't have to change the subject at all to get this to pass because one of the observations we had in writing this was that two of those branches get pushed down into the subordinate types. Uh, and it didn't even occur to me that I don't have to test this case. So like I can remove this entirely because like if it doesn't demand any actual production code, it's just an extra 14 lines some schmuck's going to have to read later. And that schmuck might be me. Um, so I'll say failed message because that's the only case. No, because it's not even... Hmm. Am, I, am I underthinking this? <laughs> There's the case of the message failing, which will have a material difference because in that case, we should not call through. So what we'll say here is test failed message does not request reply or ask for a reply. So here, um, I realize this is probably out of view. Success false, error message, huh. And then message nil. I, again, I wish I could just make these things not specified at all. Uh, I'm not gonna stub this one because you shouldn't be calling it. Uh, result, huh. Let's see if that passes. Undefined method success. Message nil. Okay. Oh, so it just didn't return it. That kind of makes sense. Does it though? Let's get less clever about uh, assigning things in Booleans. That fixes us. Okay, that was it. So you gotta actually return the message. Now, if we wanted to, we could also use mocktail to assure ourselves, assure ourselves that we don't call that transmit uh, method because maybe it's expensive. In fact, it is literally expensive. It costs like a penny in real life. So we don't wanna just like accidentally call for a whole bunch of these. So it's probably worth asserting. So what we can do is we can say assert uh, empty. I think that's a thing. And we can do mocktail.calls. We can say transmits message uh, transmit. So that'll get all the calls back. Uh, yeah, and it should just be empty. That passed again. I don't trust it. So I'm going to take a look at what. Uh, no, wait, not transmits message. Uh, saves message is the other one. <sighs> oh boy. Saves message. And then also add a K just for fun. Okay, so I expected that to be empty. It was not empty because stuff was in it. So there you go. Makes me reasonably confident that that test is reasonable. If I add that same value here, of course, like that should fail. It does fail. Additionally, once in a while, if I'm feeling saucy, or particularly unconfident in here. I, I know this is not going to invoke it, so I'm fine. But I might I might print it out anyway, just to be really, really sure that I'm I'm specifying the interactions I think I have. It's not a shortcoming of the tool by any stretch, uh, but it, it is... Um, I like to play with my food. <laughs> I like to grope it from all the different angles and, 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 and play with it, because this isn't a design exercise. This is a... How does it feel to invoke this thing? Does the result object feel right? Does the API, is it simple? Or does it require me to do a bunch of work before I you know, send something in? 
if it does, could I have some intermediary object do the translation? So right now there's only two dependencies here. All we did was split an object into two. The perfect number for these is normally three because three means like you have like sort of an extract, get the information, transform, you know, do some sort of transformation and then finally like a load operation. But here, like because OpenAI is doing all the work for us, there's not really a transform step. We're just shunting uh, messages across. Now, of course, like here's the, uh, uh, I mentioned the aristocrats earlier. The real aristocrats is when I go and try to use this, oh, what's going to happen? It's going to blow up because I broke it because that method doesn't have an implementation. So when you do something like this, you're actually signing up for just more tests, just more stuff. These tests, now this test, if we were to write a test of saves message, that would be an active record test because all it does is call active record stuff, right? Um, I'm not gonna do that because in the interest of time, I wanna wrap up at, at, at roughly an hour. So what we're gonna say instead is we're just gonna slam in, all about slamming in this slow code movement that I've been selling y'all on. Da, 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 da. Um, so we're gonna say asks, now I, now I want to move this out of ask for reply. If all these things here are using that same result object, I'm going to just pull it up into chat. Call it a message result. I'm going to say message result, because now I'm in the chat's namespace, so it should just be there. New, um, message, message, success uh, with the dingus. Oh yeah, cool. I, I don't need to branch. I can say message persisted. That's a good one. And then uh, error message could be, and I'll make some space for myself just to get this out here. Uh, message.errors at full messages join. Perfect. That's actually completely right. Now it's completely right until it doesn't work. And I'm like, and that's why you write tests. Uh, the best thing about being a thought leader is that you can have it both ways. Sorry, everybody. I'm a big old hypocrite. All right, that looks good enough for government work. Uh, of course, I, I'm gonna have to update my test now for this reference. So I'm gonna check out the test again. I'm gonna say, hey, result.new. Yep, yep, yep. We're gonna say message res uh, there's, there's gonna be enough of these that I'm going to not, not globally search and replace. I'm going to locally say, yo, every time there's one of these, we're gonna say message result. looks fine. Uh, I'm going to make sure that worked. That worked. Never trust a test you haven't seen fail unless you're pretty confident you just changed a name. Next up, transmits message. So we have our little cheat sheet. Just do this. Just call that and then we get a response and that response has a success. What else is on that response, huh? JSON dig. Oof. All right. So here's an interesting thing. The transmit message is also, I, I undercooked this bird. We're gonna have to work some overtime. Uh-oh. Because I don't think that this transmit message should know about how to save stuff because it's not, it wouldn't be doing what it says on the tin. It should return this. And if it's successful, it should return a message. And if it's not, maybe just nil, because like there's not additional state or errors. Oh, there are additional errors. Ooh. And this is how the ifs bubble back up again. All right, so let's think through what we're doing here. So if the response is success, hmm, man, I don't like this at all. Now this makes me really want to because it's so close. Or I could reuse the, the result object and instead of calling it message, I could call it data, which is, I realize not helpful, like not great, because like it wouldn't pass any sort of type test, test, but the message is only ever used to be passed around. Oh boy. Ah, in the interest of time, I'm gonna just, do it. Um, 
result object data Hate this so much. I'm so sorry. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna call it object for now. Oof. If you're mad at me for what I am currently doing, just know I'm also mad at me. But this is it's fine. It's fine. Now, of course, this is not an object. It's just text. This is helpful. Call it result now. We've already written the test, so we're going to have to update the test as well. That's fine. All this is fine. Uh, before we do, let's just finish this thought. So if response.success, then we are going to return a message result. Oh, and then I called it a message result. Boy, I screwed up. I got, I got way over my skis. I probably should have just stuck to my guns and just called this a result. Um, but you know what? We don't have a lot of code and this is the cheapest time to fix this stuff, to, to make these changes. And so honestly, it's kind of a, again, I'm having it both ways here, I realize that. It's nice because when we're writing tests like this, when we're working outside in like this, we are, uh, we have an, a, huge advantage of there's no other users of this code so we can be very very liberal in our uh, uh ripping it up to shreds and renaming it until we really like where we are at or at least are very comfortable with shipping it uh, as opposed to having this called in 20 places and only then kind of coming back to a code review that's all oh, this name is bad and then we spend all afternoon changing it. all right Result, error message, success. Uh, we're, we're well over an hour at this point. Will we get there? I am intent on getting there because otherwise what are we going to do next? We just futz around with this. Um, result, save message. I'm, I'm, I realize I'm scrambling. Thank you. Result dot new. Success. Actually, will dig work correctly? Maybe I can do I can pull the same crap I did last time and just do result. This is the correct result if it happens to be there. Success is response.success, which is set on the object that we have defined, I believe, in that HTTP. Yep, success in JSON. And finally, error message. Uh, where was I setting that before? It's probably over here. Yep, dig. So will dig work when it is nonsense? I don't know that. Uh, I, I think it will. Okay, so we're going to get this if statement out of there. All right. Now that'll get us so far to the point that what is being returned by transmits message to this asks for reply is a thing that needs to be saved again, unfortunately. So we're going to get back to this state of if reply message or reply, uh, re reply response, I suppose. Reply result equals this, and that is now successful. Nope, we're gonna do the same thing as before. So here, if reply result is success, else, all right. So much for saving ourselves ifs and else's. I was like, huh, how did that work? Okay. Okay, so if it's successful, uh, we need to save it yet again. 
Are we going to end up with more if and else's? Stay tuned. Uh, saves, message, save, chat, reply result, message. Not message, it's going to be result. Uh, now the naming makes me mad. Oh boy. I've really gummed up the works here, everyone. This is, um, it's not that I'm like performing worse than usual. It's that like, this is just how I am with myself. I'm just, it's all happening in my head normally. I'm never happy. I'm never content. Always iterating and iterating. All right. Unknown keyword message. Sure. So where in my test am I referring to message all over the place? That's all message. Um, I'm just going to change it manually. Result. Oof. Try that again. Undefined method success for nil. All right. Which one? Are we Undefined method message. Where? Thirty nine. Oh, date. Yeah, the error. Uh, okay, result dot result. <laughs> oh. No. No, 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 no. I've got lots of regrets. Okay, where are you? Is that for? And this actually fails as we would expect. This is the happy case. This would fail as we expect because we have to stub this subsequent message with yet another one. There's three interactions happening now across two dependencies. So what we need to do is we need to stub saves message. I realize we're way over time. You're going to be late to your next class. I'm very sorry for that. This time, though, instead of some chat, oh, also we will be getting some chat, I suppose. Uh, and text hello, what we will be getting instead is text reply message, because this is going to get passed along. We'll save the reply. Because... Now, this is not a message. This is just, we'll call it reply string to be clear. And now we expect, now the baton is a three-step process. So first you get the, clear out my search. So the first step in the baton is we pass it these attributes. We get back something called the message. Then we transmit something called the message, and we get back reply string. Then we save something with a reply string. We get back the reply. And finally, the result of the penultimate or the ultimate thing is the reply. That's what we ultimately want. That's the ultimate thing that we're passing back to the controller. And that passes. Okay. So that passes. That means that interaction works. Does it also mean we need to cover this negative case? Like very possibly. But I'm going to skip that for now. Instead, I'm going to go and see whether or not our chat works. Hello? It would seem like the answer to that is no. <laughs> Let's go and test this out. My network. Didn't see any red. I don't see it saving anything. That's not good. All right. What am I doing wrong? Let's 
saves message. It takes the adders. Oh, right. Doit. Nope, not doit. Yeah, text reply result result. So that should be right. We get all the way here. What's happened? It's not getting here. I get here. Okay, what's save response look like? Success false. Okay. Why was it unsuccessful? Because I never called save. <laughs> because I never called save. That would do it. Because we don't have a test for this class. When you don't save the, um, uh, the thing, it doesn't work as well. Hello. I'm still raising hell. Okay, go back. Go forward. Go back. Okay, it did save that, actually. It didn't save the reply, which is telling. Oh, yeah, because I raised. All right, undefined method dig for JSON. Really? Oh, right. Because there is nothing in error. Wait. What is response? It's result. Oh, response.json.dig. That's all. All right. So here we are. I failed some kind of purity test here when I should have like also test driven these other things because now doing it through the browser feels dirty. Try. Fuzzy, gomen nasai. Yoko wo karimasen deshita. Mo ishido oshiete kudasai. Um, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Please try again. All right. Uh, uh, this lesson was long and maybe boring, and probably unconvincing that you should go and adopt my approach to testing. But I hope it was helpful. Uh, the lesson was long and boring. Um. But hopefully, I, I think it was useful. Uh, all right. Thanks. Thanks, uh, ChatGPT. ChatJPN, that's our tool. I'm going to call it there. Um, we're going to do our uh, ceremonial commit everything right at the end here uh, and just scan for obvious uh, uh, crimes against humanity, I suppose. We have a test now that's pretty super. Write a test. Can't push it. There's nowhere to push it to. And now when we look at this ask for rep uh, reply thing, there is still branching, but all it's doing is delegating the real work. So this thing's job is now just one job. It's tell people to do work and then branch based on their success and failure. It's a, it's an, it, it is an improvement. Uh, all right. So that was fun. That was just a little bit of stuff. Uh, now we've got... Three units that each have one job. You know, if we look at and recap here, saves message, one job. This is not the ideal way to, to do it. Maybe I would have just said save normally. I don't know. Transmits message, one job, pulls out a response. Cool. So mash on command H. Yeah. Uh, next week, I think we should probably try uh, either styling this thing a little bit, or maybe better is using that new Chat GPT four GPT four Chat GPT API to make the conversation flow a little nicer and see how much work that is. Yeah, that's uh, that's about all we've got. So sorry we went so far over. This is the longest. Searles after dark. I hope you brought a snack. I didn't. In fact, I haven't even really eaten today 
So I should probably go do that. It's always a joy. Thanks for joining me on this journey. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, hopefully this was, uh, you know, I'm not here to shill a particular way to write software. I'm just sharing how I work. And maybe that's useful to you. And maybe, you know, maybe you look at this and it makes you feel better about how you already do stuff on your own. That's totally fine. Uh, yeah. And that's about all I got. I'll see you next time, I guess. I don't know. All right. Okay. Bye forever. Bye.